Sorry guys for taking so long this video. I caught a lot of illnesses over the last month, which has made putting out a video impossible. But here I am now and expect some more content soon. Thanks for waiting. When we last left off in this alternate history, the Spanish had just colonized Latin America, and Europe was stagnating under a combination of Catholic theocracy and serf-dominated economy. So how can we project this alternate history forward? The Europeans were likely still around the Horn of Africa. I wasn't able to destroy Europe's skill with boats in this timeline, and so it would be attempted by the Portuguese. However, this would have little meaning, because Europe was only able to take over the Indian Ocean region because of the military revolution. A puny number of Europeans were able to defeat the native naval forces because the European ships placed cannons on their boats effectively. Meanwhile, the Asian navies still mostly fought in a medieval style in which the ships would connect and fight melee. This allowed the Europeans to defeat the Asian navies pretty easily, and gain control over most of the world's oceans. However, with no military revolution, the Europeans wouldn't have such a clear advantage over the native navies. A handful of European ships would reach the Indian Ocean and accomplish nothing, being swept away by the Turkish or Gujarati ships. The Ottoman Turks, who had recently conquered Egypt, were in the position of gaining dominance over the western half of the Indian Ocean's trade, and this would happen in this timeline. The Ottomans would come to control the trade passing between Egypt and India. This would make the empire much wealthier, but frankly the Ottomans generally expanded as far as they could without completely overextending their supply lines, so this wouldn't result in a larger empire, or at least a much larger empire. This would mean the Muslims would remain in control over the Indian Ocean. The European entrance would be a blip. It's actually thought by some credible historians that the Muslims circumnavigated Africa before the Portuguese, but had no use for the route because they controlled the easier one over North Africa. The European expedition would be similar in this timeline. The Muslim control over the Indian Ocean would result in the further spread of Islamic culture over the region. The entire Philippines would likely be converted to Islam, along with possibly Madagascar. The Muslims would likely eventually discover Australia at some point over the centuries. The northern coast of Australia would likely become inundated with Muslim Indonesian trading cities, while the south would remain aboriginal. The British and the French would likely still discover and colonize North America. America and Canada would become like Latin America, however. No offense, but Spain was the least modern of the Western European countries in the early modern period. The Spanish mind was ruled by the Inquisition, which meant Spain skipped out on the Enlightenment, Reformation, and Scientific Revolutions. The economy was heavily rural and ruled by a jerk aristocratic class. Spain created a far more extreme form of its society abroad. As I said before in the previous video, Latin America was more medieval than the Middle Ages. This would be America and Canada in this timeline. I've covered this pretty well in another one of my videos, What If America Was a Third World Country, which you should check out. Basically, America and Canada become highly class-based societies in which a small aristocratic ruling class would control all the land and the rest of the population would be serfs. This would mean that an advanced economy would never develop. Just swap out Anglican control for the mind for the Inquisition, and you've got a pretty good picture. America and Canada would be countries like Brazil or Mexico in our world. A positive side effect would be that the natives would survive much better. The Catholic nations tended to be much nicer to the natives than the Protestants. The Portuguese, French, and Spanish kept the natives around to a much greater degree than the English and Dutch, who just committed genocide. The Catholic Church tended to view the natives as potential converts, while the Protestants as savages would be driven aside to make room for more Protestants. In America especially, the natives would have survived to a much better degree. This is especially true in the southeast, where the native kingdoms were fairly advanced and were only barely wiped out in our timeline. Native Americans would be a large minority in America today, probably between 10 and 20 percent of the population, like the Maori in New Zealand. The Atlantic slave trade would still happen, the ruling classes in Europe would still want luxury goods like tobacco and sugar, and the natives and whites would still die of the tropical diseases. Also, the Muslims had their own thriving African slave trade, which involved millions more people and deaths than the Atlantic one. Russia is a pretty complicated situation. Throughout the Middle Ages, the story of Russia was a story of the native Slavic population desperately trying to fight off the nomadic hordes of the southern grassland. However, the combined discovery of gunpowder and bureaucratic warfare allowed the Russians to smash the nomadic tribes and conquer the heart of Asia. 
This was also helped by the Black Death disproportionately killing the native horse tribes, along with Genghis Khan wiping out all the civilized peoples off the face of the earth, which left Central Asia pretty empty for the Russians. In our timeline, Russia, along with most of Eastern Europe, took gunpowder around 1500, but ignored bureaucratic warfare. Peter the Great introduced bureaucratic warfare around 1700, and that allowed Russia to become a world power and finally smash the nomadic tribes. This creates an awkward situation. The Russians would still beat the Mongol Tartar Khanate of Kazan, which was defeated by Ivan the Terrible in our world without bureaucratic warfare. The Russians would still spread across the forest parts of Siberia, which was sparked by the fur trade. The Russians were also able to unleash their own form of nomadic horsemen, the Cossacks who were escaped Russian peasants who took to the horse and grassland and were unleashed on the primitive native peoples. This way, the Russians expanded across Asia to the Barents Sea in Alaska in a little more than a hundred years. Something very interesting would happen in this timeline. The Cossacks would spread across Siberia and settle the grassland. However, without bureaucratic warfare, the central Moscow government would be unable to keep control over the Cossacks, and the Cossacks would build their own independent state in Central Asia and Siberia. Russian peasants, escaping the harsh conditions in Europe, would flee to the Cossacks, kind of like bored farm boys running away to become cowboys in America. The Cossacks would build their own freer, more anarchist version of Russian society, kind of like America compared to Britain in our timeline. Meanwhile, in the areas not conquered by the Cossacks, the nomads would be able to rebuild themselves from the Black Death and go on the offensive once again. We would see yet another round of Genghis Khan's and Attila's strike at civilization. The tribes would be weaker with gunpowder, but still dangerous. I mean, look at how the Manchus were still able to conquer China in 1644, and the Mughals India around 1500, or hell, look at how much damage the Comanche did in America during the Old West. The Russians would never have been able to defeat the Turkish-sponsored Crimean Tartars, meanwhile, without bureaucratic warfare either, so much of Ukraine would remain under the nomads. Japan's a very interesting case as well. If you're looking at Japan around 1600, you would expect it to do the exact same thing as Europe did a hundred years earlier. Japan's society had many similarities to Europe's. A strong merchant trading base, a noble warrior ruling class, hundreds of years of military competition between the warring duchies, which sparked the best military in Asia, an advanced naval culture, and a not completely constrictive church structure. The fact that Japan was able to transition to a western-style economy so quickly in the 19th century was that at its societal base, both cultures had a lot of similarities. Also, if you looked at what Japan was doing in that era, you would expect it. Japanese pirates wandered the eastern oceans, raiding as far as Vietnam, and the Japanese were invading Korea. However, Japan went in a diametrically opposite direction. The invasion of Korea failed miserably, and as mentioned in the previous video, the introduction of Christianity and firearms into Japan resulted in the ruling classes flipping out and banning both guns, Christianity, and contact with the outside world. Japan then turned in on itself for hundreds of years. This wouldn't have happened in this timeline. The West was a double-edged sword. On one hand, it gave the Japanese-European-style guns that gave them a massive military advantage that let them almost defeat both China and Korea simultaneously. Kind of like imagine if medieval England almost beat the rest of Europe combined. On the other hand, it introduced Christianity, which made the peasants think they <gasps> actually mattered, and gave them the guns that almost destroyed the ruling class. Without the Western guns, the Japanese invasion of Korea would have failed even worse, but Japan would have never turned in on itself without the existential threat of Christianity. The Japanese would do something very similar to England after it lost the Hundred Years' War. England had around a hundred years of isolationist wound-licking before staking out to colonize the world. Around 1700, the Japanese would have heard news about America come in from Europe and Australia from the Arabs, and would start using their naval skill to become a colonial empire. The Japanese would colonize Taiwan, the Philippines, and Malaysia, which were inhabited by primitive jungle tribes at the time. They would also likely place settlers in the fertile and temperate eastern coast of Australia, along with the Pacific Northwest of America and Canada. The Japanese would split Australia with the Muslims and America with the English and Spanish. India would obviously never be colonized by the British. In our timeline, what happened was that the Muslim Mughal Empire had expanded across most of India before becoming overstretched and imploding. This created a power vacuum and general chaos that led the British to conquer India. With this never happening, the Marathas would probably become the dominant force. 
The Marathas were South Indian hill tribes that were able to conquer much of the north center of India. However, Indian empires are inherently unstable and paper thin, so they would likely be in turn supplanted. The Afghans had been invading India once again. Before the British took over the country, the Afghans had been able to drive clear across the north of the country. The British actually had to build the walls of Calcutta on the eastern coast of India against Afghan raids. Out of the 19 invasions of India from Afghanistan, 17 have succeeded, so we can expect this pattern to continue. I'm honestly not sure who would win, the Marathas or the Afghans. The Marathas control a large region, but the Afghans generally have a pretty good track record for invasions of India. Also, Indian empires tend to collapse like a house of cards, since most of the population has no reason to care about politics due to the caste system saying only matters of the Kshatriya warrior class. Either way, India would remain divided. The British were the only ones ever to unite the subcontinent, and they did it using their superior tactics and weapons they got from bureaucratic warfare. India would remain a collection of competing Hindu and Muslim states. I've kind of ignored Europe so far in this video, mainly because it would be so boring. Europe in our timeline was so insanely hyperactive, with the Reformation, Enlightenment, Renaissance, scientific and industrial revolutions, that it's simply dull to compare it to this timeline. Europe for hundreds of years in this timeline would just be a bunch of serfs doing very little. The changed history would be enormous. Europe turned out so much technology and changed that it's simply impossible to imagine a world without it. Compare this to the other main civilizations of Islam, India, and China, which you would rack your brain to think up a single invention from this era. The world would be three or four hundred years behind what it was in our timeline. For a comparison, I would be writing this with a quill pen using cuttlefish blood while dying of yellow fever. No wait, imagining other universes would be heresy, because God predetermines everything. Meanwhile, politically not much would change in Europe until industrialization. Everyone would have equally lame militaries, and so it would all balance out in the end. Industrialization was easily one of the largest shifts ever in history, and it would never happen in this timeline. This would have massive effects. Obviously, people would live incredibly different from today, but let's look at some of the geographic differences. France is the most fertile nation in Europe and until recently the most populated and wealthy. This changed with industrialization in which the Germanic nations like Britain and Germany, for whatever reason, industrialized more and pulled further ahead. This would never happen in this timeline and France would remain the jewel in Europe's crown. Most of Africa is uninhabitable for outsiders without modern medicine. This is why it was only colonized by European powers a hundred years ago. Without industrialization, this would never happen. Most of Africa would remain backwards and unconnected with the rest of the world for this reason. However, the Muslims were probing into Africa for hundreds of years. The Muslim slave trade was massive and led to large inroads into the continent. Muslim states hugged the eastern coast of Africa, and the kingdoms of the Sudan were Muslim. Even before the Europeans, the Muslims were moving into Africa. The Ottomans and Egyptians were getting shockingly far into Central Africa before the Europeans were involved. In this timeline, whoever controlled Egypt would press further into Central Africa. The Muslim states in the east coast of Africa would spread technology into the continent gradually. Muslim African kingdoms would inevitably use this to conquer further into the interior. This would spread Muslim culture and religion into the heart of Africa. I wouldn't be surprised if this process would likely take more than a thousand years due to Africa's divisive geography and the small population, and so wouldn't have progressed that far as of now. The Europeans would never have been able to pull such a great advantage on the Turkish Empire without industrialization. Instead, the Albanian Egyptian Muhammad Ali or this timeline's analog, would likely seize Constantinople and found a new dynasty that would revitalize the empire. This was prevented by the British and the French in our timeline. The Muslim Albanian Turkish Empire would likely dominate the Balkans and Middle East even today, becoming a Muslim Roman Empire. China is a massive country that's pretty hard to defeat, especially if you aren't a nomadic horse tribe. The Chinese would ignore the Japanese Empire, much as they ignored the Europeans in our timeline, until the Europeans had the industrialization to force the Chinese to pay attention to them. Without industrialization, the Japanese wouldn't be able to defeat the Chinese. Without the rude shock of getting crushed, the Chinese would have never enforced a turn to the outside world and so would remain isolationist. America would be almost completely incomprehensible from our timeline. It's entirely plausible that over the hundreds of years without railroads uniting the massive country, the South and possibly New England would split off. The Great Plains would be completely impossible to settle without the combination of industrial plows and irrigation methods. 
likely the native tribes wouldn't be fully defeated, and the cowboys would found their own nomadic white horse culture like the Mongols out on the grassland. The Japanese would meanwhile control the west coast, likely with the divider being the Rockies. Imagine how Mormon and Japanese culture might mix in Utah. Damn, the Mormons wouldn't even exist without Protestantism. The world would look something like this. The West would still colonize the Americas, albeit much more half-heartedly. The Japanese would control a large colonial empire meanwhile in the Pacific, which China would be trying to ignore. However, the real winners are the Islamic world. Islam is spread to Australia and the East and it's cut its way deep into Africa. Much of Europe and Central Asia are controlled by Islamic kingdoms. However, I can't overemphasize that the greatest changes of this world aren't on the map, they're everywhere else. The world would be stuck at a nearly medieval level, much less developed at almost every level. There would be no industrialization, no reformation, no medical revolution. People would still be traveling by horse and literacy would be rare. If you were to visit this timeline, it would be like a science fiction character visiting our own world. What if Altist? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that timeline, please comment, subscribe, support me on Patreon, and stay tuned for future videos. Thank you very much for watching.